Um, welcome everyone to the um, Youth Virtual Fellowship this morning. Um, thank you for showing up. Father, in Jesus' name, in the mighty name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, King of glory, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the ancient of days. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this gathering. We thank you for the Youth Virtual Fellowship. We thank you for everyone here. We thank you for the speaker. We thank you for how our week has been going. We thank you for helping us to see the end of another week. Father, Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the adoration in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, Lord, as we commence on the Youth Virtual Fellowship this morning, um, titled um, Immigration for Academics, Father, Lord, we pray that it will be useful for everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. And pray that the speaker that will be leading us this morning, you bring a fresh enlightenment, fresh ointment to guide us and lead us in the right direction for our purpose in Jesus' name. Yeah. Father, we pray that for every parent that will be listening to today's today's um youth virtual fellowship, well, we pray that you would help them to be able to have an attentive and listening ears, to be able to pay attention to the speaker, and it will be useful for their, for guiding their kids also in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you lead this youth virtual fellowship in the right direction in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray that for every questions that will be asked today, there will be questions that will be useful for us and for the general audience in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, for those that are still um that will still be joining us, Father, we pray that you actually bring them in Jesus' name. Amen. For in Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the name of the Lord. We thank you God for that prayer. And uh, once again, we are all welcome to today's uh, Youth Connect. And uh, my prayer is that each and every one of us will learn. And uh, at the end of it all, we will be better when we leave than we have come. And by God's grace, Youth Connect is a vibrant place. You are welcome every Saturday. If Jesus tarries, we will be here. If there will be any interruption that there won't be, like last week, we will tell you. But we have a major prayer conference once in a year. Last Saturday, it was a wonderful time. And we are trusting the Lord for abundance of testimonies that are already following and flowing in. And as we start today, I invite the host, our brother Daniel Deru, to continue with the introduction of the speaker. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, sir. Um, thank you once again for, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today, this Saturday. And I'm very, very excited to welcome our guest speaker by the name of attorney Misi George. She is a highly accomplished legal professional and she attended Temple University where she majored in psychology and minored in philosophy. She has a Juris Doctorate degree from the Massachusetts School of Law and is a state licensed attorney. She is a certified regulatory compliance manager, a certified immigration system auditor, a project manager, and a certified anti-money laundering specialist. As of now, she is currently employed with a global financial institution where she works as a compliance transaction manager. She is also the, um, the founder of the George Immigration Law Firm, where she brings more than 10 years of experience in all forms of law to each case. And she has a strong track record in obtaining favorable results in swift resolutions. As she serves both businesses and individuals, Attorney George is, a de is as dedicated to client service as she is to legal excellence. She's active in numerous legal associations where she also volunteers her time to a range of community organizations. Attorney George has a wide breadth of experience in assisting employers with sponsoring their employees to permanent residence and temporary work visas, such as the H-1B, the L-1, the TN, O, P, and E visas, which she will get into in the presentation. Her experience covers immigrants visa petitions filed under extraordinary ability outstanding researcher, multinational manager, and executive visas, as well as national interest waiver categories and assisting clients file labor certification, 
that's PERM applications under the EB2 and EB3 categories and family-based applications, including the VAWA. It is my privilege and I'm very excited to introduce to everybody, Attorney Misi George. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Oh, that was a long introduction, but thank you. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about one of the pathways to um, permanent residency, which is, um, let me sh share my, oh, I'm trying to share my screen. So I sent a request. Can you stop connecting the Stop. Yeah, it can roll. I don't have the capability to share my screen. Let's please uh, enable her to share the screen. Okay, I'll just share the screen. Okay, I think I can now. So let me. Is is on? You should be able to share now. Yeah, it's my my Zoom is asking for permit. I guess I didn't put the permission. Multiple participants. One participant can share. No, it's not multiple. It's what we allow. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um. Do you guys see a PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. You can see your PowerPoint. Okay. So today, um, you know, like I said, I'm going to talk about uh, there are different pathways to um immigrating to the United States. Um, so I'm just going to pretty much focus on the EB two category, which is a pathway to permanent residency via a category called EB two. Um. Just a brief introduction on this presentation. The presentation, like I said, is going to focus on how academic professionals can leverage their expertise, their education to contribute to the United States. Um, the particular one I'm going to focus on is the EB2 visa. Before then, I'm going to start, you know, by where immigration comes from. So the body of the body of law that governs immigration is called the Immigration and Nationality Act. And this um, act allows the United States to provide 675,000 permanent visas each year. So these visas cut across different categories from family-based to academic-based to asylum, refugee status, and to other humanitarian um, types. The different pathways that we have to immigrate to the United States is family-based, like we all know, you know, a spouse, files for another, um, a person's files for, files for their spouse, a parent files for their child, or a child files for the parent. That's what the family category is called. Um, the employment base, which is the category where the EB2 visa falls under, is also another path. And then like I mentioned, refugee, asylum, we have the diversity visa program, which is the um, visa lottery. Unfortunately, Nigeria is not part of, you know, Nigeria has been excluded from there, but there are other countries that can you know, put in a lottery and get a visa, um, a permanent visa. And then we also have like other humanitarian relief programs. So I'm gonna just dive into the EB2 visa category. So the EB2 visa is, a, is an employment-based visa that allows anyone with an advanced degree or exceptional ability. Um, an advanced degree is typically a master's or higher. So if you have a master's degree in science, arts, 
or business, then you'll be eligible for this visa category. The other type, the other um, area is if you don't have the um, advanced degree, obviously, then there's another thing called exceptional ability. So, it, you know, basically refers to anything extra, like if you're an inventor, if you're, if you um, like a researcher, you know, something extraordinary that you've done in the area of art, science and business, then you, you'll be able to be um, eligible for this visa category called the EB2 visa. So the EB2 visa, so basically any employment-based visa, you need an employer to sponsor you. But this EB2 category allows you to file what is called a national interest waiver. This allows you to bypass an employer filing for you. So like under the employment base, we have the H-1B visa, we have the EB2 visa and other categories. The H-1B visa, you have to have an you have to have a job and that job files for you. But this EB2, allows you to self petition yourself. So it's the, because of that category, the, there's something that it put it under a national interest waiver. So that allows you to waive an employer sponsoring you. So you basically sponsor yourself. And by that, you, you know, you, you file the labor certification yourself and prove that your work benefits the United States natural interest. And some of the benefits that can be linked to it linked to academics is like I said, research, any contribution to the impact of public health, like if you're, you know, anything like, for example, like there was, there was one category that the person created this app that was able to help like public health to for people to gain access to medical care faster. That's like a, that's a contribution to public health or any type of cybersecurity, like invention, like sec national security, any technological advancement. Again, it's so broad that any category can fall into this, but that you qualify for that national interest waiver and you don't need an employer to sponsor you. Um, you know, part of the eligibility that I, like I explained before is an advanced degree. So if you have a master's degree, you're a professor, you're a PhD student or a PhD graduate, you're a medical doctor in like, overseas, you're, again, any advanced degree you want to think of in art, science, business, and um, uh, science is also divided into tech. So if you have any master's degree in tech, then you would qualify for this EB2 category. And then, like I said, if you don't have that educational, um, educational requirement, then if you have an exceptional contribution like publications, um, there's, um, you know, there's some people that don't have a master's degree, but they have publications, they've done research, they have awards like from government award, like government recognition, society recognition. Again, anything that demonstrates how your academic work or your experience or your research skills can benefit the United States, then you qualify under the EB2 NIW um, category. So there are different ways how your academics can strengthen your EB2 petition. Like I said, publications, patents, citations. If you have any peer review research, then that would qualify. And also there's something that is, um, and I think my formatting is off for some reason, but um, if you have like strong letters of recommendation from recognized experts. So if you, if you know like a professor or someone with a PhD older and they're able to write you a very strong um, expat letter for your application, that would also make you qualify for this um, visa category. And then, like I said, your, your practical impact as to show how your research or teaching can benefit the United States as a whole. So that's pretty much where the EB2 can um, contribute to, um, where, how you can fall on that EB2 category for you to be able to self-petition to get a permanent residency. So the, app, the application process for the EB2 is basically to file the, sorry, can I just pause for a second? My daughter is.
I'm so sorry for that interruption. My my daughter came up, but well, I apologize for that. So the um, application process for academics is basically, number one is to file the I-140 petition, which is the form for the um, um, the self petition. There are different categories that can file for this. So if you file, if you look at this form, you see other types of visas that can file, but this is the U um, USCIS form that you fill out to file. And then obviously you have to prove that you have an advanced degree or the exceptional ability, like I said, and then demonstrate how your work benefits the national interest. It's again, this type of category is very unique because like I said, all the employment-based visas require a job offer. But if, you're, if you fall under this category, you don't require that job offer. You can self-petition without a job offer and be able to prove that your education your experience, your research skills, you know, your academic skills um, is, is in the national interest of the United States and, and then file that application by yourself. So like I said, this, this I basically picked this um, visa category because it's based on you having an advanced degree. So a lot of people don't know if you have an advanced degree in art, business, science, um, you can self-petition to get a permanent residence in the United States. And you don't have to be located to file this application. So a lot of people from overseas are able to file it and get that approval. So if you're in Nigeria, again, you can self-petition yourself. You get the, once your EB, once the um, I-140 is approved, then you can get an immigrant visa to come into the United States. So this um, type of visa category is not location-based and even um, if you do come here as a visitor, because a lot of people also don't know that if you come to the United States as a visitor, you can still file this application mm -hmm. as long as you file it after 90 days. So there's a 90 day um, rule that you file if you qualify for this. And not to say you should come to the United States with the intent to stay, but there are some situations whereby you come in to the United States with a visiting visa you can file this application as well. So it's something that, um, you know, it's, a, it's an option for people with academics, like I say, masters. Even if you're in school as a student, if you're in school doing your masters, this is a, a route that you can also um, take advantage of, you know, to get your permanent residency. So a case study example is, a, like I said, I always say a researcher because that's always, that's, those are the people that take advantage of it, mostly people that have PhDs or researchers. But this position, like I said, is open for anyone with an advanced degree in art, business, science. So it, does, it doesn't, it's just that this, these are the people that maybe they know about it or something. But that's the case example, like a university researcher conducts a, a study in renewable energy that contributes to the US energy independence. So because of that, that is considered an exceptional ability because they're able to contribute to something that the U.S. needs. So that person can obtain the NIW by proving that their work is in the best, is in national interest. And like I said, it doesn't have to be, um, it could be a research done in Nigeria. There's so many um, researchers that have done a lot of things that impact the environment, impact energy, impact oil. You know, again, those are the things that are relevant to the national interest of the United States, and such candidates can self-petition to get this EB2 visa category. So why choose the EB2 visa category? Like I said, I've, I've said the reasons. Number one, the main one is you don't need a U.S. employer. You can self-petition and sponsor yourself. So that's, that's most all, all the other visa categories, you need a sponsor. You need an employer to do your labor certification for you and, you know, file the H-1B visa again. But this EB-2 is you don't need a, you don't need a U.S. sponsor. You can self-petition yourself. Again, because you don't need a U.S. sponsor, you can self-petition to, to, you're pretty much, so in the United States, you need a sponsor to file for you. So it could be either family, it could be an employer, it could be it could be anything. It could be a company. But in this situation, you can self-petition yourself to pretty much file that application for yourself. As long as your work focuses on, on a broader national interest. 
And for example, in I want to give an example in art because it seems like it's like a you know research. Like if you are exceptional artist in in art, right? You have that exceptional ability as well. There's some people that are very good at drawing. Again, um, there there are some um, you know, anything academic crowd that you it makes you stand out, not necessarily a researcher or anything then you can make take advantage of the EB2 NIW visa category. There are other immigration paths for academics. So like I said, I've kind of mentioned H1B, which is, um, so there's another category called the EB1. So the EB1 is a little bit more, um, I would say difficult, but the, the requirement is extraordinary ability. So basically, um, if an outstanding professor, a researcher, or what, you know, something outstanding, like even, like I said, if no matter your location, if you have that outstanding ability, then you can file the EB1. The difference between the EB1 and the EB2. So the EB1 is for outstanding, extraordinary ability. The EB2 is advanced degree. And one key difference is for the EB1, when you file the EB-1 application, your priority date for a visa. So basically any type of immigration filing that you do, you have a priority date. So your priority date for EB-1 is current, which means that you can file for the green card immediately. For the EB-2, you have to wait for your priority date because that's a second category, it's a second preference. So, you, so when you file your EB-2, you still have to wait for your priority date to be current, then you can file the green card application. So that's just the difference between EB1 and EB2. But the category, the um, requirements kind of overlap. But like I said, EB1 requires a, a higher threshold than EB2. Another um, academic route, which is, but is more temporary is the J1 F1 visa. So the J1 is basically a visitor. You can do like a exchange student and come to the United States to study then you can get a temporary um, permit to work. Of course, you're limited to work in your school and there are other hours requirements, but those are temporary um, ways to stay in the United States. But for the F1 category, you can transition after your educational, um, after your um, education requirements, then you can file your OPT, which is an op op optional practical training if you're in STEM, which is science, tech, engineering, and math, you get two years. And after that, you can get an employer to do the H-1B visa for you. So the H-1B is for you know, skilled individuals. And what I mean by skilled, it could be after college. You don't have to have a master's degree for H-1B, but the, the difference is that an employer has to file that application for you. So you know, like you go to college for computer science or whatever, and then you get your OPT for two years, and then you get an, and while you're with the employer, the employer can decide to file the H-1B visa for you. So that H-1B, eventually you can become a permanent resident and eventually get your citizenship. But like I said, the key difference between the, the H-1B and the EB-2 is that the EB-2, EB-1, you can self, you're self petitioning and you don't need an employer for that. And, so just my conclusion, because this is just a, I just kind of focused on a particular visa category, even though there are a lot of visa categories, but I wanted to make room for this because a lot of people don't know about this visa category type. So like I said, um, the NIW is a very viable path for academics seeking permanent residency. You don't need, you don't need an employer to file for you. You can self-petition yourself and, um, you know, get that, um, permanent residency route, which will give you your citizenship. So, you know, uh, research how your academic achievements align with the EB2 requirements and you look at your options. Again, there's so many options to immigrate to the United States. It's not just the typical way that people do. And I don't, I don't want to say that, but we all know typical route that people think is the only option. I've met so many people that are highly educated in Nigeria and come here and don't know about this option. So this is a very viable option. self petition yourself 
to get your permanent residency and your United States citizenship. So that concludes, uh, I just wanted to have time for questions, but I wanted to bring this um, visa category that a lot of people are not aware of and just share with you guys. So if you mm -hmm. have any questions, the floor is open. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I do encourage the questions not to be, you know, personal immigration questions because like this is a public forum and I don't think you want that, you know, I don't know. So any questions, I can take questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, ma'am. So we got a few questions in our chat. The first one is, what are some of the circumstances that would void or nullify a visa application? I'm sorry, I didn't, the, the line was breaking up. All right, so the question was, what are some of the circumstances that would void or nullify a visa application? So that's a general question. So I don't know if the person wants to specify because it depends on the visa category. So did you come, are you talking about visiting? Or, you know, what, what is the visa category? And, but if it's a general question, for example, I mentioned that if you're a visitor and you come into the United States, if you file your EB2 before 90 days, that would void that because you can't do that. So you cannot come in, once you come in to the United States and you file another application within 90 days, it shows that you had the intent to come in to the United States to immigrate. And that will be considered a lie because you, did your application to come in as a visitor. So that's an example that can void your visa application for EB2. So again, I don't know the specific visa type, but there's so many things that can void your application. You know, um, inconsistency, inconsistency in your application, maybe your initial visiting application, you put you in marriage, now you're putting single. You know, there's any inconsistency is something that can void your application. Or any, um, <laughs> yeah, like I said, any inconsistency, they are very thorough, they're very detail-oriented. Um, whatever, whatever application you put when you're coming into the United States, stick to it. I know there's some situations that can change, but you have to explain why that changed. So if you come in married and you maybe you file, you get a divorce with your spouse or whatever, you cannot just put it in the form that you're now single. You have to provide proof. Now I'm single, you have to provide your divorce certificate and all that. So those are things that can void your application, inconsistencies. Um, if you file before that 90 days um, deadline, I don't know if that answered the question, but it depends on the visa category and, and, and I'm not really sure, um, but that's just an example of how you can avoid it. All right, thank you for that. Uh, another question was, how often are the EB2s granted and how do you proof the extra extraordinary ability? The EB2s are uh, they're granted quite often if you're able to prove your application. Like I said, um, if you don't, so I'm assuming the person asking does not have the advanced degree. Is that what it is to prove the extraordinary ability? So if you don't have an advanced degree, then you have to think of how you stand out. Like I said, awards, did you get, have you gotten any awards, any recognition by, you know, your certifications? If you have like Let's say you're you have a um an undergrad science where you've done a lot of applications like CISA, CISM. You have all these applications that can help your your exceptional ability as well because those certifications are not easy to come by. Your membership to professional organizations, if you you know you're a member of ISACA, that's a very um popular IT organization, you know, and very reputable. Um, ISACA, they they give their situations where ISACA gives awards, they give recognition, someone can recommend you for an award in ISAC. So, you know, those, if you have like all those recognitions in those professional organizations, that makes you stand out. Um, if you have publications, if your thesis was recognized in your school, maybe your master's thesis was, was so exceptional, your school gave you an award for it. Like anything is not, is not too, um, is not, what is that word? It's not irrelevant. So if you've received any awards, any recognition, that, that would be ways to prove your extraordinary ability. And of course, like I mentioned, expat letter, letters, that's very important. If you have um, letters of recommendations from people, reputable people in that position that can vouch for you, then those are also areas to prove your extraordinary abilities as well. 
All right, thank you. So the next question is, what are some of the forms of ID or residency that an individual can present after that 90 day period of applying that shows their active status in the US pending their EB1 slash EB2 application denial or approval? So the forms of ID, so um, usually what I recommend if you come in as a visitor is always better because um, you know when you come in, you have a duration of stay that you can stay. So it's always better after the 90 days to file a change of status to F4, which can be done in the United States. A lot of people don't know that as well. So you can come in and decide you want to go to school. You, there's something called the I-539 that you can file, which is a change of status to change you to F1. So that F1, obviously you have to get admission to a school. It could be a community college. It could be anything. When you change your status to F1, that gives you a longer stay as opposed to uh, uh, being a B2 visa, um, B2 applicant that, I don't, you know, usually they give you a time that you can stay in the United States. So if the 90 days is up, if the 90 days is almost up and your um your stay is like coming to an end, obviously you're gonna be out of status. It's very important for EB2, you have to file while in status. As a visitor or F1, you cannot overstay and file EB2. If you overstay, that's another way that your your visa application can be voided. So back to that first question. If you overstay, so overstaying is you stay in the United States without changing your status to something else either by extending your B2 status, which is a visiting status, or changing to F1 status, then that visa application will be voided. So like I said, what I recommend is to change to F1. You have to leave the United States, contrary to what people think, that you have to go back to Nigeria and get F1 visa, that's not true. You can change, you, you can file for a change of status here, as long as you get a school to give you that I-20. The I-20 is the, um, the, um, the visa that the school gives you for you to attend school. But you have to officially change your status from a B-2, which is the visiting, to that F-1. So there are a lot of schools do that. All you just need to do is file the I-539 form, which is a change of status, or the extension of status, which is extending your visa, your visiting visa, so that your application is not voided. And once you do that, that's the type, you know, what, like once you change from B1 to F1, then the form of ID is your, you know, your student ID. You can still use your Nigerian, your Nigerian passport will still be valid, but at least you have a more, um, a longer stay in the United States. I don't know if that answers the question. All right. Thank you for that wonderful explanation. Uh, uh, the next question is, can you please elaborate more on these two prongs of the exceptional ability criteria? membership in a professional association and other comparable evidence. Are these where the recommendation letters peer reviews come in? Yes. So like I said, the, the exceptional ability criteria is very subjective. It's very broad. It's different things. Um, the example that I gave is uh, ISACA. ISACA. I'm sorry? I'm sure it's the same. Are you, I, I don't know if the person was- Go on, go on. I think somebody did not meet their phone. Yes, so um, the um, the ISACA is, a, is an example of a professional um, organization that you can that you can require. Um, like I said, the exceptional ability obviously require your transcript, any type of you know academic records that you have, any certifications. Like I said, yeah, if you go to, that's just an example. If you go to school and you remember, um, you have the CISA, the CISM, the um, series, you know, those, those certifications are, you know, you able to, you having the ability to pass those certifications shows that you have exceptional ability because they're, they're hard to pass, right? So those are ways to show exceptional, your academic records. Hopefully you had good grades because they do look at your academic records. Um, like I said, professional membership to all this, there are different memberships. ISACA is just the one that comes to my mind. Like for me, as an attorney, there are professional um, that I belong to. Also as a um, certified regulatory uh, manager, I have organizations I belong to. So those professional organizations, they, the, those help as well. Those professional organizations, they have award, um, 
award processes, like someone can recommend you for an award. Even LinkedIn, LinkedIn has some certifications you can get. So LinkedIn has awards that you can get. So again, nothing is irrelevant. Anything that shows that you are exceptional. And again, that word is very vague, but it helps. It it's a. I feel like the it, it's very subjective. It's something that you would have to put together. And of course, the expert letters helps a lot. The more expert letters you can get. For me, I recommend at least 10. So if you have professors that can speak highly of you, and those professors, they attach their information. They're, they're not people that, they're people that USCIS can go look for and talk to. So again, another way that your application can be voided is if you make up a letter of recommendation for yourself, USCIS looks them up, they don't exist, it's gonna be voided. So when you do all this application, it has to be real people, it has to be people that know about your application because they're gonna write a letter to the United States telling the United States why you're exceptional, telling the United States that you've what, what you've done, your relevance, like when you were a student with them, you were exceptional, you were this, you were that, and again, their information has to be attached because the United States is gonna go look to see if that person exists. So again, the more truthful your application is no inconsistencies, no back way, you know, obviously your academic records as well, something that they will verify. EB2 is a process that they do vet very well because they wanna make sure you are saying that you're in the interest of the United States. So. Those, those are just examples, like I said, professional membership, expert letters, certifications. No certification is too small, even if it's the um, AWS certification. There's so many certifications out there that you can get that, that can help boost your EB2 um, application. All right, thank you for that. <clears throat> Another question was, uh, is it possible, so this, this is a person asking, right? Is it possible to do a different course for masters or something different from the course that he studied for uh, the bachelor's of science oh yeah very possible that's it's very there are so many people that did like philosophy in undergrad and they end up doing it masters in it oh yeah it's very possible very very possible as long as you have the ability to you know excel in this in the in the study there's so many people that they were doing engineering before and they moved to nursing yeah, it's it's very possible as long as you have the ability to adapt and get you know do well. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter. All right. So, uh, next question is, what is the likelihood of getting in through the EBT, even if you have a graduate degree, and how often are they granted? Even if you have a graduate degree. Oh. Yeah. I mean, like you I said it's. I, I can't say that how often it's granted, but it, it is granted. Many people are here with EP. And um, a lot of people, back in the days, a lot of people used to assume you have to have a PhD older, but it's not true. It's just an advanced degree. So it's if you have your application right, it's granted quite often, as um, you know, more often than people think. Um, Usually what I've noticed is the Nigerian community is not really aware of it, but if you do talk to Indians and, you know, Asian community, they're very much aware of it. So that's why I'm bringing awareness. I'm taking it upon myself to bring awareness to our community because it's not a popular thing that our community knows. But if you talk to Indians, they're very much aware of it. So it's, it's, off, it's granted often, as long as your application is not inconsistent, as long as you can prove what they're asking for, yeah, it's 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 granted. There's not, you know, I can't say how often or anything because any immigration application, it's it's case by case basis, right? If you can provide the proof that you need for that visa category, they will approve you. All right, thank you for that answer. Uh, next question is, uh, can a valid F one visa holder? A student already in a U.S. college or university apply for the EB one or EB two without the I twenty. Um, I'm not sure of that question, but because if you're F one, then you should have I twenty. So I'm not, I'm not sure what they're asking. Are you, 
did you come in as F1 and you're no longer in school? Or because I'm not sure why you would be F1 and you wouldn't have the I-20. Does that make sense? Because F1, you are an F1 student because of the I-20. So if the person can please clarify, maybe the person came in. If if you're out of, I don't, I don't want the person to clarify because I don't want them to be more personal. If you're out of status in any way, you cannot apply for the EB2 visa. So I'm assuming maybe the person came in as an F1 and stopped going to school. Then you're no longer F1 in that situation if you don't have a valid I-20 because it's I-20 that is sponsoring you to be F1. So if you have that, if you had that F1 status and you're no longer taking classes, then you're no longer in status. Yes, your the visa is there, but usually the visa is duration of studies, right? If you're no longer taking classes, then you're not in status and you can't apply for EB2 visa. All right, thank you for that. So next question is, knowing that there is no exact time frame to these, what is an approximate time of waiting or the pending application status for the EB1, the EB2s, or the uh, NIW? So the EB1, EB, so let me, the EB1, EB2 is the visa category. NI is why you are, you can self-petition. So they, they kind of go hand in hand. So NIW is not another visa category. NIW just simply means national interest waiver. So they are giving you a waiver in the national interest of the United States. So EB1 and EB2 have that national interest waiver, if you can prove that. So I just want to I just want to put that out there. So EB1, <coughs> for EB, so there is another um where you can do a premium processing. So USAIS actually gives you the opportunity to do premium processing so that you can get a you can get a decision within 60 days. Obviously, it costs about $2,835. So if you're looking for a quick approval, that is an option to do premium processing. So like I said, the EB1, your priority date is current. So I do recommend that premium processing for EB1 so that you can get your approval and file the I-485, which is the permanent residency, right? Because any, any visa application, you have to, first of all, file something to change your status. For marriage, it's the, the form is I-130. For EB-1, EB-2 is I-140. So when you file that application and you do premium, you get your result in 60 days, right? And then you can file for the permanent residency. The permanent resident, you can file for the permanent residency immediately. The permanent residency, again, depends on your state. So it everything depends on where you live because they're, they're, it depends on all the applications coming in your state. So that duration is not something I can say because I don't know where you live. I do know in Texas, it's a long way, right? But remember, you will get your, you have your, you're not out of status because your application is approved. And when you file the 485, you can file a work permit, which is the I-765. So that work permit will be given to you while you're pending your um, permanent residency to be granted. So you can work um, the permit, the work permit now, the, the duration they're giving is two to five years. Some people get two years, some people get five years. So the wait for your green card to be approved, it could be anything from six months to three years, but you're in status because you have a work permit. So that's for EB1, if you do the premium route. If you don't do the premium route, the typical for EB1 is, I would say like I've seen approvals in three months, six months, 12 months. Again, it depends on all the applications. It depends on all the documents. When you provide all the documents, sometimes they will request for evidence, which would delay your application. So usually I, I tell people to be very thorough because when they ask you for evidence, number one, it has put a negative eye on your application. And number two, it's delaying your application. So if you can put everything in, I would say starting from, you could get an, I've seen people who are approved in three months. I've seen people who are approved in four months. Again, depends on your state of residency. It depends on all the paperwork that you put. For EB2, it's, it's around the same um, whatever, but remember EB2, your priority date is not current. What that means is you cannot file for the 485, which is your permanent residency, immediately. You have to wait for the priority date and then you can file that application. 
if you are out of country, they do an interview for that, like for you to be able to come in with an immigrant visa. So when you file your EB2, you get an interview. You do have to do an interview. I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that for people overseas. If you're in the United States, you don't need the interview. But again, the wait is not something I can just say, but I've seen three months, I've seen six months, I've seen two years. It depends on, it depends on how you present your application. So it's always very important to put in all your documents. It's not something you rush. It takes typically, for, for people that I've worked with, it takes like six months to gather documents because it's not, it's not something you want to rush and, um, and apply because you can be denied. But another thing is, another good thing with EB2, when you're denied, it doesn't, it's not deny, de, being denied does not mean denial. Like you can file again. That's another application. So they denied you for whatever reason, you can do another application. If you racked up more certifications, racked up more, you have more expert letters, you have, you know, you have more tenure. Again, if you like, for example, let's say you're working on an H-1B visa and you file the EB-2 on your first year of working and they deny you and you, you can wait two, three years. You've added three years to your work experience and you can file again. So it's not something that when they file, when they deny you, that's the end, like all that type of visa categories, like the family-based visa categories, for example, not all the time, but sometimes if they deny you, that's it because you, there's no other route. But the good thing about EB2 is that you can file again if you have more, more evidence. Thank you for that in-depth explanation. Next question is, uh, do you advise paying for the premium processing when submitting your petition or it's not needed per SE? Or is it, or is it not needed per se? I advise premium processing for EB1. I do advise that because like I said, your, your priority date is, is current. So once you get your approval for your EB1, you can file your green card immediately. So I do, is the premium processing is something that you can benefit from, from, the, from the EB1 category. But for the EB2, not necessarily because you still, yes, you see your approval, but you can't do anything, right? Because your priority date is not current. You still have to wait for your priority date to be able to file the I-485, which is a permanent residency. So for EB1, I definitely recommend the, the premium process. It's a little pricey, but it, it, it you can once you get the approval, you can file your green card immediately. So I do recommend it for, for some type of visa categories, yes. Family-based um, visa categories, like for a spouse, because your visa is also um, current, definitely recommend premium as well. You get your approval in 60 days, and you can file, you, you can, all the other processes you can do, you know, you can do it immediately. So family-based, I definitely recommend it for like a spouse. I do recommend it, yes. So it depends on the visa category. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is, what are some of the inconsistencies in these applications? It's kind of a broad question, but that's pretty much what it is. Yeah, I mean, I've mentioned some inconsistencies. Inconsistencies is like, you know, I wouldn't call it maybe lying, but like oversight, for lack of a better word. Like I said, you come in as married and then your your new application, you're single with no divorce records, with no explanation. That would be an inconsistency. Um, another inconsistency that I'm trying to think of is expert letters. You make up an expert letter. Again, USCIS looks at USAs, they actually ask for their LinkedIn pages or their CVs. So that's how serious it is. So if you, you know, want to be fast, do your expert letter, compose a CV, USAs is going to look for that person. The person doesn't exist or the person did not know that you filed an application and the person is like, I don't know. That's an inconsistency because USAs is going to see that this person, it could be someone you know, and I understand, you know, a lot of people don't like to share their immigration, you know, with people. But for unfortunately, for this type of visa category, any expert letter you provide, they need to know about it because they will, they may be called upon, and it will be very, very, um, it will be look, it was a very bad look for USIS to call your reference, and your reference does not know about it. 
that's that's an inconsistency. So you know there are different inconsistencies. Um, uh, for I'm trying to think, even for example, especially for people that come in as um, a visitor and then change to F1. That can be an inconsistency. There is no explanation for that. Why did you, in your visa application, you said you were coming to visit? So again, those are, so when you're filing your change of, you need to put a valid reason why you now want to be a student and why you did not say that to the consulate in Nigeria or any country you're coming from and you came in as a visitor. That's another inconsistency. But a lot of inconsistencies are usually cleared up through affidavits or, you know, explanations or providing documentation, but never just file. If you know you've changed something, then you need to provide an explanation for it. So those are examples of inconsistencies that that can make um your visa be denied. There are some, you know, inconsistencies. For example, the going back to the old marriage thing, some people provide divorces that were not done in court, they do verify those documents and those are inconsistencies. So a lot of, you know, a lot of times, yes, you may be divorced in customary court or divorced in your family. You know, some people, maybe they they did a court wedding, they did traditional, they dissolved it by returning bride price or whatever, but there's no court record. That's an inconsistency because USCIS is gonna go back to review the legal documents in Nigeria, believe it or not. I know we think Nigeria does not have information, but USCIS does correspond with Nigeria to check documents, especially divorce records. This is a big issue for a lot of people because if USCIS cannot find your divorce record and you provided a notarized divorce record or whatever, that's an inconsistency and your application can be denied. And if it's denied with prejudice, then you cannot even file again. So, because once they see um, fraud or an appearance of fraud, that is a reason to deny you with prejudice. And when they do that, then you don't even have any other option. Even, even believe it or not, even if you file another route, you know, for example, you file EB2, it was denied because of fraud, and then you marry, a genuinely marry a U.S. citizen, you have a family with a U.S. citizen, and then you file for that U.S. citizen. USCIS can go back to that application and say, you committed fraud when you filed your EB2. So you have to be careful. Any documents that you provide to USCIS, they're very, very, they're, you know, it's not like before. They do a lot of vetting now. They do FaceTime calls now. They do visits. So you know, those are inconsistencies that can affect your application. Or you say you live somewhere and you don't. They can come in, maybe you're living, you you know, you're living somewhere else, but your address or USI is another person's address. They can visit you. And if you're not there, that's an inconsistency that can affect your application. So. All right. That was the last question. If anybody else have any more questions, you can always leave it in the chat box or you can unmute your mic to ask the question yourself. But that's all the questions there are so far. Thank you, man, for your explanations. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really, really, really appreciate uh, your participation today. You really brought in our knowledge about this. Uh, especially this uh, an area, like you said, that we have not really tapped in our community, which could be of help, tremendous help for a lot, a lot of our relatives and our brethren too, our friends. Uh, we just pray that the Lord, we continue to bless you for really giving us so much insight into this. Uh, we thank the Lord for you. We just hope that uh, you will still be available any other time when we want to have you again, because I know yeah, a lot of people to come back on to talk about you know other visa categories. Okay. But again, um, I just feel like a lot of our society they're not really aware of the EB two route. I've seen highly educated people that go another route because they didn't know about EB two, and it's very important for EB two for you to file as soon as you can because once you get out of status, you cannot file again. You have to meant you have to go back to status before you can file EB2. So that's why I'm bringing that on.
knowledge you. to our community. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. And we thank you for all that are connected today. Uh, we are trusting the Lord that you will be back next week, all of us, uh, for our program again. All, all those who connected today, the Lord bless you richly. Uh, pass our information to others. We'll be back again next week. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, how grateful we are for your love and your kindness towards us. Thank you for our presenter of today. Thank you for, your, for the grace that you've invested in her. This is something that people will have to pay a lot of money for consultancy fee to get. And she has willingly come on to really help us with this, to broaden our knowledge, especially this is an area that is, uh, I cannot say obscure, but it's an unexploited area for many of us, for people that we, that are or some of our relatives. I pray that Lord that you continue to bless her. You continue to uphold her and her household. And that in her career, you continue to enlarge her. You continue to make way for her. Thank you for all those who have learned from this. We pray that, Lord, we all make use of it to be able to help people who are close to us. Thank you, Lord, for this forum. And thank you for all the participants. As we depart today, we are not departing from your presence. We pray, Lord, that you continue to go with us. You continue to shelter us. You continue to bless each and every one of us. Thank you, everlasting Father. We give you glory. We give you adoration. Blessed be your holy name. As we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, profess on ourselves uh, Psalm 23 in verse 6. Let's personalize it. Surely, Surely goodness, goodness and mercy shall follow me, me. all the days of my life. I shall be the presence of the Lord, of the Lord forever, forever and ever. ever. Amen. 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 Thank you for all the participants. We bless the name of the Lord for you. Thank, Thank you God for our presenter. See you next week. If Jesus tarries, this life will be open same time next week. God Amen. bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Bless you. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Yes,